Opalaka, the hidden history of the Moors in Florida. Opalaka is a very unusual suburb of Miami, founded in 1925 by controversial inventor Glenn Curtis. Now, who is Glenn Curtis, and why is he often listed as one of the most influential men in American history? Well, perhaps the better question is, why on earth did the inventor of some of the earliest planes and motorcycles decide to drop everything and move to a secluded area of South Florida and build an entire city from scratch? A city unlike any other in the world, a city designed in a completely alien style. Opalaka, Florida is the largest collection of Moorish revival architecture in the Western Hemisphere. This begs the question, was this city founded or found? It will be shown in this video that Curtis was likely not the developer of this town, but the Moors themselves who brought Moorish architecture to Florida. The views expressed in this video do not necessarily reflect my own. Now enjoy. Welcome to Florida Baby. Introducing Dr. Narco Longo. Glenn Curtis came to prominence in the early 1900s by adapting a V8 engine to motorcycles and breaking multiple land speed records. He would then go on to adapt gas engines for airships, blimps, and zeppelins. Curtis always seemed to invent and revolutionize wherever he went. At his first job ever, at what would later become Kodak Photography, he invented both a stencil machine and a type of camera, with no prior experience or education to go off of. However, in 1907, he was approached by Alexander Graham Bell, the false inventor of the telephone and offered a career in aeroplanes. I'm no engineer or physicist, but I would say that this is quite a jump, especially for a motorcyclist with only a middle school education. In an effort to understand Curtis, let's take a deeper look at Bell. The man credited with the invention of the telephone is Alexander Graham Bell. However, it's not as straightforward as that, as many other inventors were involved in the discovery process. Now, it's true that Bell was the first person to come up with the most practical design of the telephone and patent it, but other inventors such as Elisha Gray and Antonio Miucci were actually the first people with the idea of a handheld communications device. There's a lot of controversy around this topic and that's because Italian immigrant Antonio Miucci began the process of developing the telephone's design in 1849 which is 27 years before Bell was credited with the invention. But alongside Miucci, there was another man. College professor Elisha Gray actually announced he had invented the telephone's design on the same day as Bell. Neither man attended the office where the patents were arranged. Their lawyers did. Historical reports suggest on February 14, 1876, Bell's lawyer reached the office first and was therefore awarded the patent for the design. However, there are counterclaims which suggest there was some wrongdoing by individuals and possibly Bell himself in the patent office to ensure that he was handed the patent. In 2002 though, Miucci was recognized by the US Congress as the telephone's inventor instead of Bell 113 years after his death. 
The House of Representatives' decision encouraged claims in Italy that Bell, a wealthy Scottish man, had only found his fame and fortune through the theft of Miucci's work. Despite having no prior experience in aeronautics, Curtis was immediately thrust to the forefront of the blossoming airplane industry. He was, in fact, in direct competition with the Wright brothers. Bell and Curtis actually had a couple things in common, plagiarism and fraud. Many historians believe that Glenn Curtis attempted to take credit for the Wright's advancements in aeroplane development. He was defeated in a series of court cases by the Wright brothers, which led to another serious scandal. In 1914, Curtis conspired with various members of the Smithsonian to discredit the Wright brothers' claim to the first flight, usurping the Wrights with a former head of the Smithsonian, Samuel Langley. This cover-up is well documented and is one of the Smithsonian's most embarrassing scandals, but certainly not their last. The fraud was not rectified in, until 1928. But hey, that's okay. Everyone deserves a third chance, and what do you do when you've scammed and frauded your way to disgrace? You pack up and move to Florida. An interesting side note, leading up to World War I, Curtis pioneered the use of airplanes in combat, resulting in the complete obsolescence of all static forts on the entire planet, especially star forts. Back to Opalaka, it's rather odd that a man embroiled in scandal who seemed to eat, breathe, and sleep nothing but engines would drop everything to develop an entire Moorish-themed city, complete with 80 Moorish revival buildings and facilities, all accomplished in a year. In fact, they try to claim that Opalaka was modeled after an imaginary representation of the Arabian Nights. What's even odder is that Curtis did not just develop one town in the area, but three separate neighboring towns. Starting in 1921 with Hialeah, Florida, he then allegedly went on to develop Miami Springs, and lastly his magnum opus, Opalaka, in 1925. It all came crashing down, however, when the Great Hurricane of 1926 devastated the Miami area. Of the 80 or so buildings in Opalaka, only 20 survived. The same level of destruction was seen in Ialia and Miami Springs. Did Glenn Curtis not know when hurricane season was, or even what a hurricane was? It's pretty confusing that somebody would so impulsively build such a susceptible city. Rather conveniently, Glenn Curtis's personal mansion in the Opalaka's centerpiece City Hall miraculously survived. It's also worth noting that these buildings have survived every single subsequent hurricane since 1926, so it's safe to say these structures are decently hurricane-proof. What made the 1926 hurricane so special? Curtis must have been facing a lot of questions before his untimely death in 1930. He died suddenly while in court, ironically, of appendicitis. Perhaps he was a loose end in an already hard-to-believe narrative. Allow me to give a more plausible, old-world explanation of these events. Curtis was never really an inventor. He was merely another inheritor one of the men entrusted with adapting the technologies of the quote-unquote Tartarian hydroelectric grid into the Rockefeller-controlled internal combustion energy model. This is pretty evident, considering he literally just took existing concepts and slapped gasoline engines on them. His true accomplishment was forever intertwining vehicular innovation with energy dependency. To summarize, at one point not so long ago, energy and technology were free, for lack of a better word. 
but the industrialists took over and made it scarce and expensive. Gas engines adapted by Curtis played a massive role in this. Regardless of your position on Tartaria or Atlantis, this holds true. Curtis was tasked by Bell with one cover-up, but began taking too much heat, and was then removed from the public's eye and tasked with another cover-up, erasing all traces of the Moors and Tartaria from Florida. This had already been achieved in many urban areas, but areas like Opalaca were not under firm control, and many Seminole Indians lived there before Curtis arrived. Opalaca is a Seminole name. If you haven't watched my video on the Seminoles, you might be a little behind on this, but bear with me. The Seminoles, who dress like no other Native Americans, are undoubtedly of Moorish or Celtic ancestry. Semi Knoll has the same root as Semitic, meaning Hebrew or Mediterranean. The Seminoles are descended from the Muscogee tribe, from the same root as Moscow, and thus the St. Petersburg, Florida, and the St. Petersburg, Russia. When explorers arrived, they found what looked like Muslim-influenced Russian Orthodox architecture in Florida, an undeniable Tartarian connection. After getting to Florida and claiming to invent the airboat, of course, Curtis would begin either destroying pre-existing structures or remodeling them with the intent of westernizing them just enough to be integrated more smoothly with the European people populating Florida. These tourists had no idea they were facilitating archaeological cover-ups. They were just buying neat vacation homes. The 1926 hurricane would be the perfect storm for Curtis's mission. To put it plainly, I am of the opinion that he was demolishing ancient structures and blamed it on the hurricane. Before we wrap up, let's understand some of the terminology that is used in this presentation. The Moors, also known as Berbers, come from the areas around Morocco. This region of North Africa was also referred to as Barbary at various points in history. Tartaria is often the name given to all traces of old world architecture and technology. It is a bit of a misnomer but one that I embrace. Tartaria today is a region in and around Russia. Barbar and Tartar are the same word. One simply denotes the people west of the Roman Empire and the other those east of the Roman Empire. So, to summarize, Tartaria lied east of Rome and Barbary lied west. This explains why both Germanic and North African peoples are barbarians, and both the Chinese and Russian are Tartarians, from the Roman perspective. Let's not waste energy trying to cement these ambiguous misnomers onto specific groups of people who likely did a lot of migrating and called themselves something completely different. <laughs>